so this past Sunday night, we were discussing Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 12, and in verses 1 through 8, it's a very familiar passage. It says this, there's a time for everything and a season for everything under the sun. And then it goes into some basic experiences like this. It says, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to weep and a time to mourn, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to be silent and a time to speak. As we discuss these experiences, the group as a whole agreed that these will all occur. These, these basic experiences that I just read, and there's more even throughout the passage, all of these will occur whether we are ready or not. Whether we receive them with open arms or reject them in passive disregard, no matter what, all of us will experience this in some way. We have experienced it, we are experiencing or will experience that at some point in our life. In essence, it's, in it, it's inevitable. But then we looked at uh, two particular verses that kind of created a contrast within my thinking and in my, within myself. Verses, uh, verse 11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the, the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Okay, all right. As I read that, I was like, Okay, I agree with you, Solomon. It's beautiful. Everything is beautiful in its time. But then the next thing he says is this, that God has set eternity in the human heart. Now, there's just something about that statement. It could be that he has made humanity for eternity, or maybe eternity for humanity, who knows? Because according to the Bible, whether it's heaven or hell, we all will live forever. Eternal, either in eternal bliss in the presence of God or eternal suffering being separated from God forever. But setting our hearts to eternity, as it says in verse 11, would seem to be more just, uh, not just about what happens after. It sounds to me that there's a yearning and a longing that goes beyond time and thought and matter. But what he says in verse 14 should bring a peace and assurance to each one of us. He says this, I know that everything that God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. There it is. The moment that it finally makes sense, everything that God does will endure forever. There's no question, there's no asterisk there. That's complete and utter truth. King Solomon says the natural response from humanity should be the fear of God. An expression of of admiration mixed with, with fear or a deep respect or awe for him. And yet life happens. Of course, the intention of a person's heart is one thing, but to follow through with the intention is entirely different. It goes beyond ability and brings us to the possibility of willingness. Willingness. You see, because just because someone is able to do something doesn't necessarily mean that they're willing to do it. In light of remembering the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf, I want us to look at a passage that should encourage and challenge us at the same time. The encouraging part is that we are not alone. You know that, right? You're not alone. If you feel it today, stop believing the lie of the enemy. You are not alone. God has promised his presence and power and peace in our lives. Second, it's challenging because there will be times in our lives that God calls us out of our comfort zone. We've all been there, right? There will be times in life that it would seem that we are pushed to the brink of of our faith, that we'll have these sleepless nights, the moments that we question everything. There's circumstances that will happen to us, experiences that will never, ever make sense, 
And when we try to make sense of it all, we may become discouraged and disappointed and maybe even upset or angry. But God provides hope and assurance through his love and grace. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to Romans 8, 31 through 39. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Should, a, should be a pretty familiar passage to you. We're going to look at the first few verses, verses 31 through 35. Questions and answers, a confidence boost. It's the first part. Paul writes, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? You know, right before this passage, Paul goes into uh, extensive detail about the comparison between present suffering and future glory. And he begins by saying in verse 18, he says this, I I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Elsewhere in Colossians 1.27, Paul even calls this, uh, uh, this comparison that he's about to say, it's a mystery. He says, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Whew. Woo! How can this be so? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. There it is. The all-surpassing power is not from us. It's from God. You see, Paul reminds them of all this, but, but for what purpose? Why does he remind them of all this? For a confidence boost. To build up their faith and trust and confidence in God. You know, there's been times in my life that I've doubted. How many of you have doubted before? Maybe you doubted before you came to church. Maybe you're doubting right now, right? Yeah, I've doubted. There have been times in my life where I've been sure, uh, unsure of something or anxiety or, or worry has tried to get the best of me and I just, I just want to say I'm very thankful for my wife Anne Marie. I am. She's awesome. She just has a way of putting it in perspective for me in these moments. And, and, and I can recall a few times where she's put it in perspective by asking some simple questions, Right? kind of pushing the reset button on my thoughts and on my feelings. She's also gotten my attention and brought awareness in my life by asking the difficult questions, right? You know how that is. Somebody asks you those difficult questions, you're like, man, why do you got to ask that? You know? But you're right. It's amazing how my demeanor and, and attitude changes even in the line of questioning. And what's fascinating is that's what Paul is doing here in this first passage that we looked at. He's not aggressive in his questioning. And my favorite part about it is he gives the answer to some of these questions. He does. I mean, have you ever needed that before? The answer to the question, right? Sometimes it can be humbling. Other times it can lift our spirits. And our hope and our prayer is when we are questioned about something, it will bring about a confidence boost, right? 
So coming off this drastic discussion of present suffering and future glory, a line of questioning begins with Paul. But what I love about this is although Paul says this phrase once in verse 31b, he says, if God is for us, he means to make it repetitive with every question that he asks. So he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I, we could sit on this question all day. Have you really thought about this before? If God is for you, who can be against you? Not the devil, not the enemy of our souls, not our enemies, not people who try to intimidate us. Not the Taliban, not the government. Who can be against us? He says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. If God is for us, think about that, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Hallelujah. God is unmatched. If God is for us, if he went to such great lengths as to sacrifice his one and only son for us, take confidence in this. His grace and truth provides all you will ever need. If God is for us, he goes on to say, if God is for us, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? He says, it is God who justifies. You see, we are in right standing, that's what justification means, with God through the substitution that Jesus made on our behalf. And he says, if God is for us, who then is the one who condemns? And then he says, no one, no one can condemn. And what's the beautiful thing about this part here, this condemnation thing? In Romans 8, 1, at the beginning of this passage, Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever. And he adds on, Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's interceding for you when you least expect it. Or when you don't feel like he's there. Jesus is interceding for you. Whew, that's awesome. He is on the throne. How good is that to know that Jesus is our mediator? And then he says, if God is for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I mean, this guy goes completely to the extreme. Like the, the possible worst case scenario. He just throws it all out there, guys. And at this point, I, I hope you ga you've gained a confidence boost. My prayer is that after this short question and answer, you have no doubts about how great and awesome God is. I mean, he's done so much for us. And he continues to work in and through our lives. And that's why God alone deserves all the praise. Second, look at verse 36, an urgent interruption. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. So for the moment, Paul directs our attention to a statement. 
And, and this actually comes from Psalm 44, which we'll look at in a moment. But this last question Paul asks, he can't help but insert a well-known psalm that every single person who was hearing this letter read or who read it themselves would know by heart. And it's as if this is the end-all example, suffering and death. But there's more to it than that. The psalmist brings it into perspective for his hearers. This statement is in the middle of a book-ended catastrophe. And God's people are at the point of desperation. They have no other option than to turn to God when we look at Psalm 44. And so we're going to look at Psalm 44, 20 through 26. It says this. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? See, what they're doing there is is by truth they're saying, hey, this isn't from idolatry. We haven't done anything wrong here. And then it says this, yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, Lord, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? And then they say this, we are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. See, there's this this urgency in this psalm. As if they're drowning and, and they need rescued. The psalmist points to the realization that, as I just said a moment ago, it, it's not idolatry that has brought them to this point. Usually what they've done is if they've, they've gone and they've idolized other false gods and then God just hands them over. That's usually the, the repetitious way of doing it. The vicious cycle that we see within the Old Testament. But it's not the case here. It's not anything as far as evil or wickedness. In fact, it sounds the exact opposite. Because of their faithfulness, they are facing extreme circumstances and consequences. And they want to know, God, when will you look upon us? When will you look upon us? When will you come to our aid? When are you going to help? See, they're in misery, and they're being oppressed, and it seems as if God does not care. It seems as if he's sleeping. That's what they actually say here. That he's more or less turned a blind eye toward uh, or away from their suffering. Why? Why, God? But this is the beautiful thing. They're Their suffering brings them back to a solid truth, which it seems as if they're commanding God to act. They're telling God, hey, rise up. This urgent interruption shows this utter need for God to move and work among his people. They say, rise up and help us, rescue us. We need you here, God. Well, why would God rescue them? Why? Is it because they're worthy of it? Is it because they've been good? Is it because they've earned it? No. None of those. Actually, it says, the psalmist writes, because of your unfailing love. It has nothing to do with them. God's going to rescue them, not because they've earned it or they've been good for a while. No, it's because of God's unfailing love. God, you've rescued us before. Come and do it again. Come and do it again. Allow your failing, unfailing love to shine through the darkness and despair. It's as if these people have been pushed to the brink of disaster, that there is no end in sight, and they need God to redeem their situation. 
And I don't know about you, but I don't think we have to look very far to know and see that Psalm 44, 20 through 26 could be said of our generation today. God has certainly been forgotten. In fact, the world and our culture is doing all that they can to try and forget God. Not just that, but to deny the truth of God's existence. Kind of like an out of sight, out of mind kind of thing, right? If we take away God from the equation, people, listen, this is their train of thought. If we take away God from the situation, well, then there's no guilt. There's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no consequences, there's no judgment. If, listen, guys, if there is no God, we can do whatever we want. Treat people however we want. Live how we want. And the best part is nobody can tell us different. But I will say, without God, you have chaos. Without God, you have disorder. Without God, you have nothingness. No truth, no hope, nothing to look forward to, no future, no eternity. I don't know. Call me simple, but that doesn't sound enjoyable at all. It actually sounds awful. It doesn't sound appealing. It sounds repulsive and dreadful. And so this urgent interruption that Paul writes here should spur us on to really appreciate and understand what God has done for us and for humanity as a whole through Jesus Christ. Lastly, look at verses 37 through 39. More than conquerors. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I'm going to go really slow right now. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good. I mean, how awesome is this? I mean, so Paul gives this all-encompassing answer to all the questions he's just asked. The last one, though, is used to drive this point home. Remember, Paul asks this urgent, uh, before this urgent interruption, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And, and, and at this point, you could probably say, well, this all sounds intriguing, Paul, but I'm still not buying it. No. Paul may just be listing these examples as examples, right? He, he's, does he actually really, has he ever really actually experienced these before? He could just be listing them. Absolutely, he has experience them. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 through 28, it says this, <laughs> five times, whew, Paul, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's four more than Jesus had. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night on the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, 
from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, I'm in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Woo, anybody overwhelmed yet? Yep. I've labored and toiled and have gone, often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have got, often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else. Listen to that. So he, he, like, here it is. This is the basis. And then he says, on top of this, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul knew exactly what he was writing here in Romans 8, 30 through 39. It's as if this was his purpose, his main life passage right here. And the exclamation of all this, the truth of it all, is that he says, after all that, after all of what I just said, we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. And the other truth I love about this passage is is that Paul says, I am convinced. Convinced. It's one thing to know something or even understand it to a certain point, but it's a whole nother thing when someone is convinced of it as if they are just as sure that the sun will rise tomorrow. I mean, they're not just persuaded to believe. They're certain of it. Hebrews 11.1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance of what we do not see. Romans 8, 37 and 39 is awesome because it reassures us of the power of God's love for us. It displays his presence, his power, and his peace. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. And, you know, I mean, it, when we read this, it, it seems dismissive to rattle the evidence that Paul gives to a certain extent. But really, just, just for a moment, just for a couple more moments here, just think about this. Nothing, nothing, not one thing, death, life, angels, demons, height, depth, present, future, no power, nothing in all creation can separate us. For we are more than conquerors in Christ. My hope and prayer is that God has given you a confidence boost today. I encourage you to highlight this passage of scripture. Write it down. Maybe even memorize it. How many of you still memorize scripture? Raise your hand if you memorize scripture. Don't be, you know, yeah. It's great to use. The more you know it, the more you memorize it, the more you say it and recite it, the deeper it sinks into our thoughts and into our beliefs and into our life. Hey, let, let's fill our minds with the word of God more than anything else, right? Let's continue to be reminded of his goodness and grace. And may we never forget that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Amen. Let's pray. Father.